자 뒤에 자리에 앉아주세요. 어, 안녕하세요. 오늘 화학과 세미나 연사를 소개하도록 하겠습니다. 나는 오늘 그 세미나 사회를 맡은 화학과의 한서엽 교수입니다. 여러분 반갑습니다. 오늘 아주 귀한 분을 우리 화학과 세미나 연사를 모셨습니다. 이분은 우리 화학 관련 연구자들에게는 아주 익숙한 매거진인 Chemical and Engineering News, CNN News라고 부르는데요. 여기에 편집장이신 Maureen Ruhi 박사님이십니다. CNN News는 우리 화학 분야 연구자들이 자주 접하는 그 미국 화학회 거기에서 매주 어, 발간하는 그런 어, 소식 일정의 소식지인데요. 전 세계적으로 우리 화학 관련 어, 과학기술 분야에서는 가장 큰 영향과 정보를 주고 있습니다. 오늘 말씀을 전하실 루희 박사님은 아시아계 여성으로서 여성과학자를 배출하는 우리 이화여자대학교 화학과에 아주 큰 관심을 가지고 계셔서 화학과에서 주관으로 오늘 세미나 연사를 모시게 되었습니다. 여성으로서 그리고 아시아인으로서 어떻게 미국 사회에서 이 화학계 주류로 성공할 수 있었는지에 대해서 오늘 재미있게 강연해 주실 것 같아요. It is my great honor to introduce Dr. Maureen Ruhi as our seminar speaker today. She is currently the editor-in-chief of the Chemical and Engineering News. Dr. Ruhi was born, raised, and educated in the Philippines. She received bachelor's and master's degrees in agricultural chemistry from the University of the Philippines. She then moved to England and was awarded her PhD degree by the University of London. Her professional experience ex includes independent research and teaching, scholarly uh, publishing, journalism, and news organization management. In 1987, she joined the American Chemical Society, where she has worked ever since. She started working at the CNE News in 1994 and took over as the editor-in-chief last year. The title of the talk she is going to present today is an Asian woman's adventures in leadership in the United States. Without further introduction, let's welcome Dr. Maureen Ruhi. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Han Su Yep, for that very kind introduction. And um, hello, everybody. I, uh, let me just get a feel of who's my audience. How many of you are chemistry majors? OK. All right. And, and how many of you? So the ones who are not chemistry majors, what are your majors? Anybody? Just, just shout it out. Nobody? Some people didn't raise their hands. So what are you majoring in? Biology? Biochemistry? All chemistry. Excellent. OK, all chemistry. We're all chemists here. So um, just, to, just a show of hands. How many of you are familiar with, with the magazine Chemical and Engineering News? OK, people from ACS, you should be, but OK. Not, so, so not a lot of people. All right, well, I hope, I hope that um, I will be able to convince you a little bit today that you really uh, want to be uh, engaged with chemical and engineering news. So um, I want to first of all thank uh, Professor Joan Valentine. Uh, she, she and her husband, uh, Andy, uh, planted the seeds for my first ever visit to Korea, and also to Professor Won Woo Nam for, for, for inviting me to Iwa Women's University. I've had such a great time admiring your facilities and uh, all the amenities. I, you are so lucky to be studying in this place. I wish I could go back to school. I'd go back here if I could. Um, so, so Professor Nam asked me to talk about uh, you know leadership experience as my leadership experience experience as an Asian immigrant into the United States. But before I do that, I want to tell you about what we do at Chemical and Engineering News. Is this the pointer? Yes. All right. So this is, this are, this is, uh, these are covers, previous covers of Chemical and Engineering News. And if you are serious about being a chemistry professional, you really should be 
interested also in chemical engin and engineering news. In, in addition to the journals, the scholarly journals that you have to read every day for your own research, the reason for that is um, you want to be aware of what's going on outside your field of expertise, which is you know, what, you, what you read about all the time. And the reason you want to read about uh, things outside your field of expertise is because, first of all, it just enriches you as a, as a researcher. Uh, secondly, I think you, you're going to find information that may be able to um, expand your network or influence the direction of your research and your, and your career. And chemical engin and engineering news is the most con comprehensive news publication covering the chemistry enterprise. We cover a lot of the science and technology uh, of, 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 of the chemistry enterprise, which means academic research, industry research, and government research. We also cover the business of chemistry. And the business of chemistry is about the industries, the companies, pharmaceutical companies, chemical companies, biotechs, that employ chemists. And, and then we also talk about the regulations that um, the, that uh, dictate the use of chemicals and also the practice of chemistry. So um, if you're not using CNEN, you should start doing it now. Um, how many of you have smartphones? How many of you have, okay. A anybody who has a smartphone can actually take advantage of CNEN. Just go to the app store, look for the, amp, you know, the, the, the letter C and then ampersand EN, Download the application, it's free. <laughs> now, more than, more than 50 writers, reporters, and designers are involved in producing CNEN. We are, we are published weekly, every week except the last Monday of the year. So it takes a lot of work to produce something, a magazine, every, every week. And these are some of the people who help um, produce the magazine. This was our last, most recent class picture. It was taken in the fall, uh, just soon after I took over as editor-in-chief. But to show you some of them, let me just t tell you if, uh, some, some of the people in my group. So we have four writing groups in, in, our, in chemical and engineering news. Oops, sorry. Um, so this is, these are some of the people in our um, science, technology, and education group. These are, this are some of the folks in our business group. They write about business. These people write about, these reporters and editors write about uh, government policy and regulations. And these three women write about ACS policies and activities. We are also the official organ of the American Chemical Society. So part of our mission is to inform its members of the policies of the, um, and activities of, the, of, the, of their professional organization. And this is the leadership team of, of the magazine. That's uh, the editor-in-chief. This is the deputy editor-in-chief, our managing editor, and the um, online editor. Now, we have reporters. We're based in Washington, D.C., but we have reporters in various places. So we have, um, let's see, Jean-Francois is in Hong Kong. He speaks, uh, he's Canadian, so he speaks French, English, Mandarin, Cantonese, and Japanese. And he's based in Hong Kong. He, he, writes, he writes for our business well. Alex Scott is, um, is an Englishman. He, he lives just outside of London. Uh, Sarah Everts is our um, European science correspondent, so she's, she's based in Berlin. And then we have several PhD, uh, mo most of us who are in the writing, editing uh, staff of CNEN are trained in science, particularly chemistry, and uh, many of us have PhDs, actually. Uh, let's see, Mitch Jacoby has a PhD, Beth Halford has a PhD, Ann Thayer, Steve Ritter has a PhD, Carmen Drahl has a PhD, uh, Britt Erickson has a PhD, Susan Morrissey, um, Lauren Wolf, and of course, and myself, I have a PhD. <laughs> and then, so these are the writers, so these are the people that create the content. And these are the people who bring that content to the page or 
online or to your mobile devices. So this, are our online, this is our online team. These are the people who do the uh, editing and production. They are headed by Kim Twambly, who is a chemical engineer. And this is our art department. Right. OK, so um, with that brief introduction of uh, our magazine, I'm going uh, I'm gonna to talk to you about how I, I got to this place. You know, how, how did I get to this place of leading a, very, a group of smart and very, very talented people? So I'm going to talk about some life experiences that have brought me to this point in my life. And um, they include being a foreigner in an Islamic country and um, a first generation immigrant to the United States. And I hope that you can learn from my experiences as you become leaders yourselves in your own spheres of work. I was born, raised, and educated in the Philippines. And the fifth child of 12 children. OK, how many of you can beat that? <laughs> Not, I don't see anybody who can beat that. OK. And like many Asian parents, my parents emphasized education as the way to a better life. And I think that's very true among Koreans as well. And like many Asian parents, they labored long and hard so that all of their 12 children could go to college. My parents did not have a lot of money. And we're such a big family, sometimes we didn't always have enough food on the table. Because in addition to 12 children, my parents were taking care of my cousins, my aunts and uncles, so we had a really an extended family. So we didn't actually starve. But if, you, if, my, if, if my mother called and said, time for lunch, if you didn't come as soon as she called, chances are you're going to be left with just a bowl of rice. I grew up being cared for by my older brothers, by my aunts and uncles, and also by older cousins. And when my parents immigrated to the United States, they continued to help care for uh, the young ones of the family, in this case, their grandchildren. So the first lesson from my early life is the importance of family in laying down the groundwork for success. And as a leader, I translate this lesson in the workplace <coughs> into fostering a flexibility that enables my coworkers, my colleagues, to meet their family obligations and to have a healthy work-life balance. Now, I don't know about you, in, I don't know about Korea, but in the United States, it's very seldom for families to actually have their immediate extended families around them. I know many colleagues who are just, you know, it's just the husband and wife and the kid, and they have nobody else. So when they need help, there's really no immediate family around. And so I encourage people who have this kind of lifestyle to develop very strong friendships at work and in their communities. You have to build your own communities. You have to build your own sort of family so that when you are in need of help, there are people around you who can, who can be of help to you. And if we provide an environment where workers don't have to worry about, you know, I have to leave the work early today because I need to get my daughter from the daycare, or I can't come to work today because my child is really, is, is really sick, so I'm just going to work at home. If, we, if they have that kind of flexibility and they don't have to worry about their family, you can be sure that they're actually going to be more productive and they're going to be more committed to the work that they do. All right, let me talk about my husband. Very important guy. My husband is from Iran. Ooh. <laughs> and I lived in Iran for four years. Living in Iran was my first experience of immersion in a radically different culture. Remember, I grew up in the Philippines. The Philippines was very, is a very Western 
type country. You know, at the time that I was growing up, it was pop music and miniskirts, and that's the kind of environment I grew in. And then I went to Iran, and 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 in Iran, it's you know at the time of the just right after the revolution. So one vivid memory of my life in Iran is um, one day I was walking, and I was carrying my daughter. Just you know, she was one years old. I was carrying her. I was walking down the street, and um, a woman in a chador. You know this. You know what a chador is? It's like this this blanket that you put on top. She stopped me and, 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 and she talked to me and then she noticed my daughter and she said, oh, what a beautiful daughter. And of course I was like, oh yeah, my daughter. <laughs> um, but, and then she asked me, where is her mother? <laughs> and I'm like, ooh, what do you mean? So, so, so that was a very puzzling moment for me. It's like, this, so this woman was looking at my daughter and she actually did, at the, at the time, she actually didn't look very much like me. She had very fair skin. She had really a nice kind of, you know, Iranian nose, not like mine, you know, and she had this very perfectly shaped Persian eyebrows. She didn't look like me. And so I was just like thinking, and at the time also in Iran, um, there, were, there were many Filipina women who were there working as housekeepers or nannies. So I was thinking like, oh, she thinks because I look like a Filipino, then I must be a nanny. So, so I, 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 at that point I was like, yeah, you're, you're stereotyping me. And, and that's not a good thing. Oops, sorry. And so having been, having been the subject of stereotyping, I learned from my life in Iran to avoid stereotyping people. As a leader, I translate this lesson into an awareness of my own biases so that I do not form misguided impressions of other people. Now, the best way, I think, to avoid stereotyping others or being stereotyped is to get to know and understand people who are not like you, who don't look like you. That's, that's of course, easier said than done. But in a global economy, where you're going to have to work with people from all kinds of backgrounds, working, uh, being able to adapt to them and, and just treasuring them or valuing them for their uh, abilities and potential, not for any kind of preconceived notions, is a very critical leadership skill. So I came to, I came to the United States from Iran in the late 1980s. At the time, I was practically a single mother. Uh, I had a two-year-old child with me and only $400 to my name. My husband couldn't come with us because at the time, the, well, until now, there are no diplomatic relationship, uh, relations between the Iran and the United States. And so getting a visa was a big hassle. So my husband said, just go and he will follow. So I was on, I, I was with my daughter and $400. So although I had a PhD, so by this time I had a PhD in chemistry, I had been an assistant professor in the University of the Philippines, and I had also worked as a researcher at the Atomic Energy Organization of Iran. But because I did my PhD in the United States, I really had no professional connections in the United States. So trying to start to build a career based on you know, teaching or research was really, was really difficult. I quickly realized that. And I, so I said, OK, I've got to go to plan B. I have to figure out how else I can make a living, because I had a daughter to support. So my first job was um, in a drugstore, in a chain drugstore. You must have them here as well. You know, the drugstores are not just for medicine. You can also buy, I don't know, shampoo and toiletries and cosmetics. So that was my first job. I was stocking nail polish and eye, eye, you know, eye makeup in a drugstore and earning minimum wage. That was the first thing I did. And that was, I did that in the afternoons while my parents were looking after my daughter. And then in the mornings, I would look for a job. I would go through the papers. I'd look, do all kinds of research to try to look for a job. And that, for me, it was, was really making uh, lemonade out of a lemon that I was handed out. 
The story, about, the story with my husband is, is very similar. So eventually my husband was able to join us many years later. Uh, but when he, came to, when he came to the United States, so my husband also got his degree in, 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 in England. No connections, no professional connections in the US. At that point, he had a PhD. He was a, he was a, a, a very well-known um, agricultural engineer in Iran. He had been working uh, with the World Bank, with working on projects funded by the World Bank in Iran. So he had a very full professional life. He comes to the United States and, you know, it doesn't translate, you know? So what do you do? So the first thing my husband did was, well, you know, let's, he joined my, my brothers. My brothers were in the carpet business. They, were, they would go to new houses and lay out carpets. It's physical work. And my husband did that. The other thing that my husband did, he actually worked for a Korean crew that was laying out wooden floors in newly, in newly um, uh, built houses. So he did that for a while. And then eventually he was able to find a place at the US Department of Agriculture. Somebody, somebody gave him a lab and said, well, you can come here and do some work with us, uh, but we can't pay you. <coughs> So it was just like volunteer work. OK, and my husband said, sure, fine, I'll come. I'll do, I'll do work for you. And he, di he did that for about two years for no pay, even, not even gasoline money. And he had, to, he had to drive like 70 miles round trip every day. So both of us, my, my, my husband and I, you know, our, for our first, our, one of the lessons from our first few years as immigrants is to make lemonade out of, out of lemons. And, and, and as a leader, I translate this lesson into an ability to manage expectations. So what do you do if, you, if what you expect doesn't happen? You have to quickly regroup and find something else that can work for you. OK, so I was working at the drugstore, right? And so one day, as I was going through the um, newspaper, I found an ad from the American Society of Microbiology. And they were looking for <coughs> copy editor training. Now, how many of you know what a copy editor does? Uh, a copy editor is somebody, when you're publishing something, it, this, is, this is the person who looks at what you've written and corrects all the grammar and corrects all your misspellings and, and, and practically makes what you do really come out very nice. So that, and, and it was the first, uh, this was his first scholarly journal. So I was, I was gonna be trained to copy edit manuscripts that were going to be published in scholarly journals. It wasn't even a real job. It was going to be a training. If I was good, they'll hire me. OK. It happened that I actually was quite good at that work. It, it really suited me. I was suited for that. And so I, I learned the ropes so fast that you know I finished the training in five months instead of six. And so they hired me. Well, that was actually the foot, my foot in the door of an entirely new career, which is scholarly publishing and communicating science. And that door, having my foot in that door, has led me to scientific editing, journal management, books acquisition, multimedia production, scientific uh, science journalism, and now to leading a multimedia news organization. Similarly, my, my husband found, it, found an ad uh, from the Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District. They were looking for, for an urban environmental engineer. So the two years that he worked for free at USDA actually kind of paid off because by working, by volunteering his time, he established a reputation for himself. People began to know him. So by the time there was a real job available, people were very willing to give him solid recommendations. So another lesson from my first years as an immigrant in the United States is that getting your foot in the door is a great first step. And in my, in my career, I have translated this lesson into having the courage to ask people to take a chance on me with new assignments and responsibilities. Just give me a chance. I want to try it. And if I can do it, you know, then great. If not, then you can close the door. 
but a foot in the door is not enough. You have to get the basics right as well. If, if somebody offers you, gives you an opportunity, you have to be able to deliver. So you have to master the skills and learn the knowledge that the job requires. No one will keep a job if they cannot do it adequately. No way. So, but if you have multiple skills, then if something bad happens, for whatever reason, you can't keep one job, because of multiple skills, you have an advantage in finding other jobs. So as highly educated as I already was, I had all the kinds of education I needed but this point. But in order to advance in my new uh, specialized area, I had to learn a wide variety of skills. Okay, I had to learn how to index books, how to code manuscripts for typesetting, how to conduct peer review, how to prepare scripts for educational videos, how to edit videos, how to create graphics and chemical drawings, how to take photographs, how to design books, how to conduct interviews, how to craft compelling stories, how to write headlines, how to explain esoteric research to the public, and how to get the most out of a creative team of individuals. And my learning continues. So I've even tried to acquire skills that you might think, you know, what does this have to do with being a scientist or being, a, you know, being an editor? So let me tell you. I've taken up acting with a Shakespeare company in Washington, DC. I don't know what that has to do with science. Uh, I've taken up dancing, ballroom dancing. <laughs> the only reason I stopped is because my knees were giving me problems. <laughs> and I have taken yoga and still continue studying yoga and meditation. That's a practice that I have uh, just cultivated through all the years. And sometime this year, I promised myself that I'm going to take a class in improvisational comedy. You know what that is? Okay, I'm going to be, I'm, I'm going to try my skill at improv. And you, you're probably wondering what, what does this all have to do? Well, we can talk about it after, uh, after my talk, but there's really, it's, these skills really help me face the challenges that come at me every day. So one lesson, therefore, I have learned as I have progressed in my career is that learning should be a lifelong activity. And in my work as a leader, I have translated this lesson into championing professional growth of staff through all, by, any, by any means. All right, I'm going to shift gears here. I'm going to shift into um, behaviors that I believe foster success, not just, you know, not just in the workplace, but in our lives in general. Show appreciation. I don't know anybody who doesn't want to be appreciated. We all need to know that we are valuable, that what we do is valuable. And we all need appreciation, especially after we've put in so much work and we've done a really good job. That's just, a human, that's just human nature. All right, this is the one picture I'm gonna show. And I don't know if you know this person. Some people here know this person. This is Madeline Jacobs. Madeline Jacobs is the executive director and chief executive officer of the American Ch Chemical Society. She was formerly an editor-in-chief of Chemical and Engineering News. And um, I've known her since 1994 when I joined Chemical and Engineering News. I consider her a friend as well as a mentor. And one of the things that one notices about Madeline is her great enthusiasm for people and her, gr and her great ability to show appreciation for people. I mean, I've, I've, I, I can remember her going around you know, our corridors when somebody has done something really um, great. For example, somebody sent in a story from Ghana. We had a correspondent in Ghana, and, and we, were, we were a little bit worried about communication at that time was uh, kind of iffy. And she got the phone call, and she got the story, and then she was running around and, we have the story, we have the story. And you know, she was like a cheerleader. And she was inspiring all of us because of her enthusiasm. And the, the fact that she always recognized 
the, the work that we did. All of us at CNN, we just really, really appreciated that. Now, you might think that, you know, showing appreciation is just, you know, the boss showing appreciation for uh, the worker ants. Actually, in my, in my, in my world view, this has to be a two-way street. So how many of you have ever thanked your teacher, for example, or your boss, <laughs> or, your, or your leader? You know, when they've done, or, you know, your professor. How many of you ever thought about thanking your professor for, for example, one day he just gives this magnificent lecture. How many, how many of you have, have ever thought about coming up to him and say, you know what, that was really a cool lecture. You can't imagine how good that, that feels to hear that, that recognition. Even among people who, whom you think they don't need it. They do. All of us need it. And I can tell you, the more you appreciate, the more you will be remembered. So I've told you that I've lived in Iran. And the years I lived in Iran were 1982 to 1986. Now, I don't know. I mean, many of you are probably too young to know about the Iran-Iraq war. But I couldn't have picked a worse time. The Islamic Revolution was young. It was zealous and determined to impose Islamic rule on everybody. And like everybody else in Iran at the time, any, any, any female over 13 years old, I had to cover myself, you know, my hair, my arms, my legs, okay? Any, even just a little wisp of the hair coming from a scarf is enough for the modesty police to come to, to you and say, please fix your scarf. That's, that was the, that was the um, context that I was in. Now, in addition, the Iran-Iraq war was raging at the time. And the two countries were bombing each other's capital cities. So we were getting air raids in Tehran. We lived in Tehran. And one of the main targets of the Iraqi bombers was the house of the Supreme Leader of Iran, the Ayatollah Khomeini. And again, I don't know if you know the Ayatollah Khomeini, but he's the guy responsible for the Iranian Revolution. And the, and the Iraqis wanted to kill him. So they were targeting his area, his, his, uh, his residential area. And we happened to live nearby. <laughs> so when Iraqi bombs came, you know, we knew it was going to be somewhere around us. And we actually, uh, we actually lived through a couple of bombs dropping nearby. Thankfully, not on our house, but nearby. So just think about that. You know, I just came from England. I was raised in the Philippines. I came from England. I, I, got, I get married and I get into this crazy <laughs> environment. But I chose to marry an Iranian. That was my choice. And I was determined to adapt. And so one of the things that I did in Iran was actually to learn Farsi, the Persian language, on my own, with the help of a few books. On my own, I learned enough to have you know, pleasantries, to exchange pleasantries, um, to ask for things in the market, to go, and sh to go shopping. I could, I, could, I could go shopping. Or to, um, to ask the taxi to take me somewhere. I, I learned enough of that. And, um, for the most part, I embraced Iranian customs and culture while I was living in Iran. And that ability to adapt really served me well. It, for, first of all, it, it endeared me to my Iranian family. They love me. My, my, my mother-in-law, uh, according to my husband, my mother-in-law preferred me among all of her daughters-in-law who, <laughs> who were all Iranians. Uh, so, so what can I say? Um, so the ability to adapt is something that, you know, to changing circumstances is something that um, will serve you well in, 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 in your leadership role. All right, so I have been a reporter for 10 years. So I, was, I joined CNN in 1994. I had been a reporter for 10 years, 2004, before I got my first management position in CNN. And how it happened was really um, unusual. I actually created a position for myself. Yes, and how did it happen? Well, you know, my boss came to me one day. I was, I was getting my annual review. 
And my boss was asking me for some, you know, some advice. He said, you know, I have a lot of work. My, I am so overworked because there were 10 of us who were reporting to him. And I said, and he asked me like, do you have any idea how, how I can, uh, how I can relieve myself of so much, of so much work? So I said, okay, let me think about it. I went home, and the next day I had a proposal. I said, what you need is a deputy. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you assign a deputy, then have that deputy take five of your direct reports and manage those five, then you will only be left with the other five or with the other four, and, 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 and your work will be, will be reduced, greatly reduced. And then, of course, I also said, I volunteer to be the deputy. You know, I just said that. And I said, no expectations. I didn't, you know, this is a proposal. Take it or leave it. <laughs> well, happily, to my delight and surprise, not only did my boss like the idea, everybody else in CNN liked the idea. So without further ado, they said, OK, Maureen, you're going to be deputy assistant managing editor for science, technology, and education. And that is where my management role in, uh, in chemical and engineering news began. So from there, I, beca I quickly became managing editor. And from managing editor, I became deputy editor-in-chief, which I served for five years. And then, of course, last year, I successfully applied for the position of editor-in-chief. And thankfully, they, they hired me. So, this is one of the success factors that I really want to emphasize. Don't be afraid to ask. So a lot of people are afraid to ask because, because they're afraid to be, that the answer would be no. But why, would, why should you be afraid of that? So what would happen if, they, if, if, if you ask something and, you, and the boss says no? It's the status quo, right? Nothing's changed. It's OK. But think about it. If you didn't ask, you would never get a yes. So don't be afraid to ask, because by asking, by asking, you signal something very important. You signal your aspiration, and you signal your untapped talent. And you plant the seed in the head of people who have influence and ability to help you in your career and in your profession. You, you plant that seed that you are ready for new challenges. The notion of giving back in the United States is very strong. People in the United States are amazingly generous. My employer, the American Chemical Society, I, 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 has given me a lot of support throughout the years that I have worked there. So I am a member of the American Chemical Society, and one of the ways that I give back is I volunteer my, my time to professional development activities that my uh, society does. So I try to be a mentor. I try to be a role model for other staff in the American Chemical Society. Now, I also have, I ha haven't mentioned, but during my high school, well, all of my education, actually, from high school to college to my graduate studies, I was supported by the Philippine government. I went to a school that they paid all the, the expenses, all the way. So when I went to graduate school, they also paid for my expenses all the way. So I feel a very, very strong um, debt of gratitude to the Philippines, although I, I'm no longer uh, uh, I, I no longer live in the Philippines, I'm an American citizen, but I always try to look for opportunities to serve the Philippines, to serve this country that has really, really helped me get to, to where I am. So what I encourage you is, you know, as you continue on your path to leadership uh, positions in your societies, remember those who helped you along the way, and whenever you can, give back. And in conclusion, I should tell you that I'm still a work in progress, and I will always be a work in progress. I continue to seek ways to improve myself and the world, and I continue to do the best 
that I can under whatever circumstances. Thank you. How does yoga? Oh, yoga is amazing. <laughs> yeah. So, so every morning, a part of my yoga practice is I, I do breathing exercises, and it's it's really very centering. You know, we are all in a hurry. We're all always in a hurry. And what yoga has taught me is, if you are if 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 you are feeling overwhelmed, just take time. Even just a few seconds, maybe five minutes, just take time and stop and just try not to think of anything. Just ground yourself. That's how, that's how yoga has been very, very useful to me. I mean, in, in my office, in the middle of the day, I would sometimes just close the door and just sit and just close my eyes and do some meditation. It's, it's very refreshing, because af after you've done that, I feel revived, refreshed, and, and ready to you know, get a second wind of, of energy. It's, it's, a, it's a really good, I mean, I, I'm very grateful to yoga. <laughs> yes. Yes. So the question is, what do I rely on when I am uh, frustrated or, or disappointed? You know, um, that's another good question. What do I rely on? Basically, you know, basically I rely on what I know about myself. So the thing about it is I actually know a lot about myself in the, in the sense of I know what I cannot do. And I think that's an important thing to know for everybody because we can't do everything. And if I know that something that's required of me is not something I am good at or I can deliver, then I will just say, it is not in my ability to accomplish this by myself. I have to find some other way. I have to find some help to accomplish this. So, just knowing my limitations help me, help, helps me uh, address disappointments. You know, it's some, if, if I tried something and it didn't happen, well, I will just say to myself, well, you know, you're good at other things. This is not one of them. And I can accept that. Yes? Thank you for your very impressive talk. What characteristics do Asians have? <laughs> I don't want to be stereotyping here. <laughs> but I think it's very, very well known um, in, 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 everywhere that I think Asians are, Asians are really, um, can be very focused in, in what, especially in studying. We just went through the school here and everybody was studying. Uh, Asians have, are, are, are well known for, for being focused. And I think it's just part of our upbringing. Um, I mean, I was raised by, by parents who, who, who instilled in me that, you know, hard work is rewarded. We, that's, that's just part of my ethos. And I think a, a lot of Asians also have been brought, brought up that way. So I think that's one of the things that makes Asians unique. But of course, other, you know, other kinds of people are also hardworking um, in their own way. I think I, you know, what I, what I should say is I think Asians should try to have a little bit more fun. <laughs>
Don't be like me, because when I, you know, when I was, when I did my PhD, so I was in England. I mean, I could have traveled everywhere to Europe, whatever. I, I never, I never did. I think I once went on a kind of a whirlwind trip of tour of Europe, and then another time I went to Paris. That was it. I never even went to Scotland or Ireland. I was, I was just like really focused on, I need to finish my degree. I cannot spend more time. I have to finish my degree. And now I'm like, I wish I had spent, I, I had had a little bit more fun. <laughs> Being a female boss, is, would I have um, uh, difficulty in tackling um, male? Actually, you know, um, one of the skills that uh, leader, good, effective leaders develop is just kind of being gender neutral when it comes to when it comes to working with your colleagues. Because again, this is another thing: you really don't want gender to be part of your. Of your, of your judgment of other people. You judge people by their abilities, by their potential, by what they can actually deliver. I mean, we're all scientists, so you know, we, we judge by the facts and not by, you know, by other things. So I, 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 I seriously don't think there's any difference in the way I treat men or women. At least that's what I think. <laughs> yes, please. Okay, the question is, how do you balance your career and family responsibilities? And, and obviously, I work very hard. Okay. Life balance, uh, life work balance is a, is, a, is a really tricky thing. And, you know, especially for women, this is, a, this is a very charged subject. You know, people will say, oh, we can have everything. We should be able to do anything we want, women. All right, well, also the men. But here's the point, <laughs> here's the point that I want you to think about. We can have everything. Anybody can have, can do everything that they want to do, but not just all at the same time. Okay? So in every part of your life, every stage of your life, you will always have priorities. So for example, you're here now in this wonderful campus. Your role at the moment is you are students. You are preparing for a profession. So maybe at this point, that is your highest priority. And maybe, you know, to the delight of Won Wu, you're just going to be studying, studying, studying. <laughs> that's fine. That's, fi th that's what I did, okay? Then you go to another phase of your life. Maybe you want, you want a family. So when I had, when I had my daughter, uh, when my daughter was born, I decided, I, I, I made the choice that I'm going to stop working for a while because I want to bring up my daughter. And so I stopped working for a while until I went back to work again. And for example, another, another, at another time, so during my time at CNN, even be, before I became a manager, Somebody had asked me, one of our managers had asked me, you know, Maureen, would you consider, um, you know, being in a management position? And when they asked me that question, my daughter was maybe seven, eight, nine years old. I mean, she was really young. She was still in elementary school. And I said, no way. I don't want to do anything differently from what I'm doing now because I had a lot of flexibility. I could, I could leave the, the office anytime I, I needed to. I, and I could be at home when my, when my daughter was coming home. So I decided, no, I'm not going to do that. But when my daughter finally went to high school, so at this point, she really doesn't want to be with me, right? Yeah? At some point, your kid's just like, mom, stay away. So at that point, I just said, OK, I can take a different assignment now. And I actually took an assignment that required a lot of traveling. And that was fine. So at every point of your life, you will have different needs and different priorities. And in the course of your lifetime, you would have done everything, just not at the same time. Yes? Oh. <laughs> you, mean, you mean for publication in CNN? 
Okay, very good question. All right, what kind of paper do we th th draws our attention? We're looking for papers that actually um, have a story to tell. Um, so a paper that can that we can put in a context that other people who are not experts in the field can actually appreciate. Um, so if you have a paper that can um, reach a wider audience, you know. The implications have, uh, well, the paper has implications for a wider audience. That's, that's our criteria for, for putting it in the magazine. Because our magazine is, is not for experts. This is not where you look for, you know, our magazine is for, it's really to open your eyes to what's going on in other fields. You know, what are the emerging hot trends in science? Who are the, who are the leading, uh, emerging uh, leaders in science? That's what, we, that's, that's what our magazine really does for um, chemistry professionals like you. Anybody else? Was, were there any moments when I wanted to give up my job? <laughs> Every day. <laughs> Just joking, just joking. Uh, no, no, not really, because you know I really need a job. <laughs> Maybe if I was, if I had, a, if I had some other, some other way that um, I could, I could, I could um, uh, manage financially, probably I would have entertained it. But I never had any moment that I, that I don't think that I, that I wanted to leave my job. But I think maybe the question you're asking is. What if you don't like your job? So for me, I love my job. I love what I do. Every morning, I'm really excited. I wake up, and I wake up at 4.30 in the morning, OK? But I wake up, and I'm full of energy, and I'm ready to go. And most days, I, st I stay for, for 10 hours in the office. And, and, but you know, I love my job, so it doesn't feel like a job, OK? But what happens if you don't like your job? What do you do? And I'm going to ask you to read my editorial in the April 15 issue of Chemical and Engineering News. It's about a person. It's about a person who went out of his way to find his dream job. He wasn't happy with what he was doing. He had a dream job. And he quit his job so that he could devote his time to finding, to, to, to getting what he really wanted. I think, I, 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 don't, I don't suggest that you quit if you don't like your job. I would suggest that if you don't like your job, you start looking for another job. And I, I think the best advice I can give you is find what you really enjoy doing. Don't worry about the money because Eventually, it will pay for itself. Maybe not in monetary terms, but in, in just in psychological terms. You know, you're happy, you're content. And, and I think that's a good goal, to be content and happy. Anybody else? Session. Okay. <laughs> Please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Marie Rui for the most enthusiastic lecture and the answers. Thank you.